Happy Sabbath to you all. Happy Sabbath. Welcome to the house of God today. Please up your seats. Um, we want to take this opportunity to welcome our visitor here today, um, our friends that have been here before and come back again. If you are here for the first time, raise up your hand. Okay? <laughs> if you've been here before and you come back, uh, that means you're going to join us very soon. <clears throat> And we thank all the members that came today. Thank you for uh, taking the time to be here to worship together and glorify God today. How many of us believe that Jesus is coming back soon? Amen. 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 Are we ready? Yeah, that's a good so in order to be ready, we need to tell other people about him. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come here this morning to call on your name. Thank you, Lord, for the breath of life. Thank you for dying for us on the cross and paying the penalty for our sin. Thank you, Lord, for all the blessing upon blessing that you have given us. Without you, we can do nothing. Thank you, Lord, for whom you have, for your love. Thank you, Lord, for coming down from heaven to live among us so that we know you more. Thank you, Lord, for all your people that came here today to worship you, to fellowship together, to make our request known to you because you are the only one we have. Thank you, Lord, for all our people, wide world, wherever they are worshiping you today. We thank you, Lord, for our members that cannot be here at this time. We pray that you touch them. We pray that you be with them. We pray that you provide for them. If there is any discouragement, touch their heart. Bring them back safely next week. We commit all these prayer requests onto your hand today. Individually, we have mentioned what we need. You had Sandy who talk about his friend, Joyce. You heard about Philip and his wife and the child. You know what Satan is trying to do in that family, to tear that family apart. But you, you will not allow Satan to take the free tree lap. He has lost. You have won. You know the beginning from the end. And the end from the beginning. We pray that you would give Philip and his wife and the, the child the strength they need during this difficult time, O oh Lord. Wrap your arm of love around them and give them this, the, the courage to resist Satan, so that he will flee away from them. We pray for Jacob. We pray for Mike. We pray for Anna's uh, family as a whole. Come and visit them individually. We pray for Elisa. We pray for, we pray for Tara, who is dealing with COVID uh, um, uh, symptoms. Heavenly Father, we pray for Barbara, his uh, uh, husband, and the grandchildren. We pray that you let them be in your fold. We pray that you touch them if there's any ailment in the family. 
He prayed for Kendra. I pray for my brother, Ray's family, the wife, and the children. As they are growing old and they are going to college, give them the wisdom to continue to make good decisions that will honor you. We pray for Perry and her family. We pray for Chuck, who is giving testimony about what you alone can do. You can bring your enemy to become your friend. Thank you, Lord, for your miracle. Thank you, Lord, for you are the Alpha and Omega. We pray, O oh Lord, for the unspoken prayers that everybody has raised up their hand for. Come and meet each one of us at our point of need, O oh Lord. We pray for our service here today. We pray that you send us the latter rain so that we will uh, wake up to get in fourth in the last, uh, uh, in, in the total uh, member involvement that the church has organized. Gear everybody up to do this, to get involved in the ministry. Bring one person, talk to a friend, so that there will be more people in your fold. We pray for your messenger of today, Edia Brian. We pray that you touch his lip and give him the message that he's going to give us today, so that this message will mix with love with faith in our life. We pray for our pastor is on vacation in his home country today. Lord, be with him throughout the vacation. Be with his, his children and the wife and the entire uh, family member and bring them back uh, safely in August. We thank you, Lord, for whom you are. We thank you, Lord, for your love for us. We thank you for being with those people that are doing your, your ministry. We pray for the uh, for our uh, church leader all over the world. Continue to be with them, oh Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you always answer our prayer. Thank you, Lord, that you have answered this prayer. For we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. We need to count our blessings, and uh, sometimes we overlook the small blessings in life, so we need to count all the blessings. The Bible says, give thanks in all things. So let's uh, practice, I mean, practice attitude of gratitude. Uh, practice attitude of gratitude. When we do that all the time, uh, we will... Uh, our complaining will be diminishing and God will listen to us more. Uh, it's time for scripture reading today and Sherry will bring us the scripture reading. Good morning. Our scripture reading is John 10. So if everybody can turn to John 10:27 and 28. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Good morning, church family. How are we doing this morning? I wish Sherry wouldn't have ran off so quick because, you know, it really gets lonely up here at times. And uh, I really am more comfortable in a teaching environment than I am standing up in front of people. But I consider you all my family. And uh, I want to give you a report real quick. It's been actually two weeks since I've been here. And for those of you that know my middle son, Adam, who has been coming and visiting with us for the last two months... We thought, or we prayed, my wife and I, that he was going to stay in Ohio, that he was going to get a job in Ohio. But Adam is a very different child 
For one, he was born in Texas, and his heart never left Texas. He graduated high school there, so he informed us two weeks ago that he accepted a position in Fort Worth, Texas. So this has been an interesting time because I also started a new job this week, so I had a week off. So um, I got to travel down to Texas with my son Adam and help him move in to an apartment. And it was a really neat time. And as I was driving, it's a really long drive. It's like a thousand mile drive down to Texas. And we were in two separate vehicles. So I had time to reflect and it dawned on me that 40 years ago to the month, I left Akron, Ohio at the age of 16 in 1982 and went to Dallas, Fort Worth area. So I was reflecting on life and where God has taken me since 1982. Interesting journey, and uh, I've shared with a few of you before um, how I came into the church. I actually graduated high school down in Texas, a little farming community called Venus, Texas. Happened to be two towns over from Keene, which uh, is Southwest Union's College in Keene, Texas. Um, in this journey, in 1984, my mom and dad got divorced after 32 years. So that was a rough time. My mom came back to Ohio and we stayed in Texas. So I was a kind of an angry young man at that time. And I heard that if you got caught in, in Keene smoking, they would arrest you. And I smoked back at that time. So I was kind of a rebel with really not much of a cause. So I went to the college and I pulled up. I had a blue 57 Chevrolet and I pulled up. What's the name of that gate at the college? Mez? Mespa, have no idea what that means. Do you know what that means? And she is a graduate up there. All right. So I pulled up to there, lit a cigarette, walked around the college. I don't know why. Just seemed like the thing to do. The only thing I remember about that college was there was three angels on the side of a building. I threw down a cigarette, snuffed it out, hopped in my car and left. Didn't think a thing about that. Two years later... I was working in Marietta, Georgia. A friend of mine, grandmother, was a Seventh-day Adventist, and we went through a Revelation seminar together and found out what those three angels meant and found out that I was surrounded by Adventists at that time. And that journey led me to Tulsa, where I met this young lady here, and I just wanted to see how that was going to end. So 32 years later... That journey has been a blessed one. We've had three children, and my middle one is Adam. So that's kind of my story as we, we start. And we ended up back here in Ohio four years ago. And as I've shared with a lot of the church members, we prayed for six months that God would lead us to a church that was on fire for the Lord. And God answered that prayer. Um, before I start this morning... The title of the sermon is, Will the Sheep Know Their Shepherd? Now, I tend to do sermons on something that, through studies, God just keeps bringing back to me over and over again. And you always kind of want a confirmation, Lord, is this really what you want me to preach on? You sure seem to be talking a lot and studying on this. It's very interesting. Naomi, did I talk to you this week? Not a bit. This morning in Sabbath school lesson, Naomi handed out a sheet highlighting the shepherd. It was interesting because that's what the sermon was going to be on this morning. So I really admire Naomi and her teachings through Sabbath school, and I learned so very much. Before we go into the sermon this morning, I'm going to invite the Holy Spirit into our presence. Dear Heavenly Father, first and foremost, I want to thank you for the Holy Spirit. You know, life here can get lonely on this earth as we live in such a sinful world, Lord, and we need to know that we are connected with you. And dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so very much for sending your Holy Spirit so in these lonely times, these difficult times, we can be connected to you. As we go into this sermon this morning, Lord, I hope that I can share with the congregation the, the journey that you've been 
been walking through with me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Before I do this, and I do this a lot, I don't read my notes, I have a quick announcement to make. Um, Tomorrow morning, Sunday, from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., we are having a work bee at Noah School. And also, I want to have our prayer warriors pray for the school. We have a lot of changes that are going on this year. A lot of amazing things, I believe, that God is leading in this school. And probably the most exciting thing, I've been a part of the school now for a year, and the one of the most exciting things that happened this school year was we had three baptisms. Three baptisms from the school, and one was a non-Adventist that joined in. So if you're wanting to get involved in something that is lasting, that is eternal, Noah is it. This is an incredible school. It is going out in the community and winning souls for Jesus Christ. So if you have time to, uh, to come up tomorrow, see your school. We, uh, this is part of our school. We have about five churches that support this school, and Elyria is one of them. So I would love to see you. If you need uh, directions, you can meet me after the sermon, and I can let you know where we're going to meet. All right. Title of the sermon was, Will the Sheep Know the Shepherd? How many people here has a profession of a shepherd? Do we have any shepherds here? Yeah. That might have been real prevalent in Jesus' time, but I had to go to YouTube, which I go to quite a bit. Uh, I've only been around a sheep one time in my life. And I'm going to share with you, how many people here have been around sheep? I raised them when I was a kid. Okay, so you would, I should have talked to you, because I I really don't know. I've been around them once. I had some friends out in Oklahoma that had a farm. Anybody know what a sheep sounds like? Yeah, well, here it is in real time. Whoop, hold on here. Let's back up and see if we can get this to work. I don't know much about them, but what I have been told about sheep, and hell, maybe you can help me out on this, is they're not real bright. They uh, are probably one of, they're a domesticated animal, and from what I have studied and talked to, they really can't survive on their own. I mean, you have to do everything for them. You have to protect them, you have to feed them, you have to water them, you have to spend time with them. Saw a documentary once. It was very interesting. In the Middle East, there's a lot of sheep. Now, I've been around cows. In Texas, I've been around a lot of cows. And cows are kind of like sheep, but a little different. In the Middle East, there will be pastures just full of sheep. And it may not be all one shepherd's sheep, but they're out there grazing. The interesting thing about sheep is they know the voice of their shepherd. So what they'll do is they will go out into a group of thousands and thousands of sheep and the shepherd will start calling his sheep. And the sheep that know their shepherd will separate themselves from the herd and that's how they bring them back to their, I guess you call them a farm, is that what you keep sheep? To the pen, to safety. I found that very interesting. I'm going to go over a few things. I did not have this information this morning, and I learned a little bit more about sheep. Naomi gave me this sheet this morning. Talks about shepherds. Found out a lot of interesting things. Do you know that shepherds give sheep everything they need? With the staff, he rescues the sheep and protects them from enemies. He leads them to green, fresh grass for meals. He gives the sheep rest in soft green pastures. He leads to quiet water, for the silly sheep are afraid of moving streams. Can you imagine that? Boy, I didn't realize they were that uh, dependent. 
All right, he checks the holes in the ground for hiding snakes before they eat. The shepherd cares for the cheap sheep tenderly and leads them back home. This one I found very interesting. The shepherd anoints the sheep's head with oil. Well, that sounds weird. Ah, but during mating season, it hopefully eases a shock of rams butting their heads that can cause injury or death. Oil lessens chance of infection. Infectious scabs that can infect the flock. Oil lessens infection. Painful larvae in the nose laid by flies. The sheep are happy, healthy, and full of joy for his loving care. Very interesting. Do you know what Jesus' profession was before he started his ministry? Yeah, he wasn't a shepherd at all. But... He lived in a region of sheep, right? How many people here are carpenters? Anybody build anything? Carpenter? Okay. Well, Jesus in my book was a blue-collar worker. I can understand blue-collar people. I don't do this during the week. I don't dress up in a suit. I'm not a, a business-type person. I'm a labor, blue-collar guy. I work with sheet metal, and that's my, my trade. And... Uh, does not require me looking after people like a shepherd. Interesting thing I found out about shepherds, when I think of shepherds, I think of two people that Jesus, that, that served Jesus that were shepherds. King David grew up as a shepherd boy. And Moses, who did not? Moses grew up in the house of Pharaoh, went out to do what he thought was God's bidding and failed miserably and was run out of Egypt. Where did, where did Moses spend 40 years of his life? As a shepherd. So apparently, being a shepherd is important to God. Turn with me to John chapter 10, verse 2 through 18. We're going to get us up to speed a little bit about Jesus, our shepherd. And what makes Jesus the true shepherd? John chapter 10, verse 2, and we will be going back and forth to 18. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. By the door, remember that term. He who enters by the door. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. In verse 4 says, And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Now, who is the sheep in this text? Who are the sheep? Who? Us. Us. We are the sheep. Do we know the voice of our shepherd? Hmm. Well, let's find out. In verse 6 it says, Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Now, not ever being around sheep, I might have a hard time understanding that too. But, Jesus the Good Shepherd... Then in verse 7, Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. So now it unfolds. Jesus said in verse 2, But he who enters the door is the shepherd of the sheep. And Jesus says, I am the door. So to follow the good shepherd, what do the sheep do? Who do they follow? Who's a good shepherd? Jesus. All right, so we follow Jesus. That's right, through the door. Remember, Jesus knocking at the door? It's interesting that Jesus knocks at the door. He doesn't kick it down. He doesn't force himself upon people. It's always, I always when I think of Jesus, I always think one of the, the best blessings he ever gave us was a free will. 
See, Jesus wants us to come to him, to sup with him. He does not force himself upon mankind. In verse 8, it says, All who have ever come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door, and if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Is that good news? Great news, right? I wish I could say that was all. Close the book and go home on, on a high note. Verse 11 says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gave his life for the sheep. Now, as it starts to unravel, the shepherd did what for his sheep? Gave his life for his sheep. That is one committed shepherd, that he is willing to die for his sheep. Verse 10, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So who's the thief in this story? Mm. So Satan is not willing to die for the sheep, die for us, right? So, in this parable that Jesus is giving us, he says in verse 12, But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming, and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. Who's the wolf? All right. Verse 14, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and lay down my life for the sheep. And the other sheep have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. So what's Jesus talking about here? The sheep that are not of the flock. Who is that? All right, those outside the church. Is Jesus Christ on earth right now? Where's Jesus at? All right. Who is he left here on earth to share the message with this dying world? That's right, us. And what is the agent that we use to have the power to share this gospel? That's right, we talked about that this morning. It's a beautiful thing that Christ, even though he is in heaven right now working in our behalf, he leaves the Holy Spirit. Anybody here talk to the Holy Spirit? Do you find comfort in that? It's neat. It's like talking to your best friend or your wife or... or I don't know. I've never had a friend like the Holy Spirit that listens. Because I talk a lot. And I question a lot. And I have a lot of things that I, I'm just a curious person by nature. Does Jesus want to answer life's questions? Is he interested in being your friend and talking to you? Mm. Yeah. That's what kind of God we serve. Therefore, in 17, it says, Therefore, my Father loves me because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. Verse 1, I skipped. Let's go back to 10, verse 1. It said, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. So, if we were sheep right now, and this is our pasture, we would all be of one fold, right? Do we all believe that Jesus Christ is our good shepherd? Why then is Jesus warning us about those that come into the fold that are not of his. What does that mean? What does that mean that sheep come into our fold that is not of him? What's he talking about here? Is he, 
Is he talking about believers? Does this ever happen? Do we ever have, when we become Christians, do all life's cares go away or are we challenged all the time? All the time, right? Mm, 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 mm. What does, uh, you said this today in Sabbath school, who is the accuser of the brethren? Satan is, right? So, does that belong in God's house, accusations towards one another? Is that a character of Christ or of Satan? This is something I've been thinking about a lot because how many here believe that there's a war going on in this church? And why? Why is that? Why would there be war going on if we all believe that the good shepherd, Christ, is our Savior? What are we fighting about? Wheat and the tares. Wheat and the tares, huh? Go together to the harvest. Is God trying to save the, the tares? Well, I'm glad he's patient. Do you think people know their tares? I don't know. I know from experience, from my experience in life, that I have said and done things in leadership positions that were not of Christ. We all are sin and fall short of the glory of God. Amen. Things that I've said, things that I've done, my attitude towards people have not been in accordance with Christ. Has anybody else ever experienced that? You don't have to raise your hand. But I know we've all experienced this. If we are all to be in one group, a sheep, what are we worried about, folks? What are we worried about? Did Jesus win at the cross? Is Jesus victorious? Then why do we fight so much among one another? Will this work ever be done if we are divided people? No. It will never be done, right? So, hmm. All right, all right. As God turns his back on us, or is he working with us? If you had a chance to go over our Sabbath school, what were we talking about this morning? Crucible. Crucible was, Naomi, help me out. It is a vessel in which heat is applied to change something into a good work. Is that right? I think of a steel mill. I live by a steel mill over in Newburgh Heights, and every once in a while, Sherry and I, we will drive down, and you'll see rail cars full of molten lava, and they'll bring it over to a different part of the plant, and they make rolled steel that your cars are made out of. I think it's pretty cool. It starts out as just a pile of, I think they call it ingots or something, and they heat it up real fiery hot, and they make something beautiful out of it, if you like Fords and Chevys and Cars like that, very beautiful, I think. But let's talk a little bit about false sheep. And why does God even, why does God mention this? Why does he give us warnings about things? Mm. Does, he, does he know that this might be a problem that is going on? In our lives, right? Because we're not there yet. And we have a... We were talking about this morning that Satan, one of his last defying acts will be imitating who? Christ, right? Who does Satan have a beef with? With Christ. So, who does he have a beef with on this earth? That's right, with us. All right, so we have this struggle going on. How many here love conflict? Do you like it? I, 
experience conflict a lot. Unfortunately, in my experience in life, I've seen the most conflict among God's people, which is kind of weird. You would think that it would be the total opposite, that the least conflict you would find is in God's house. I don't know why. I don't know why God's people cannot get along. But it seems to me that um, that seems to be the case. Pray for your pastor and pray for your elders because there is a war going on. And Satan knows if he can keep us in conflict, this message that we have will not go out. And there will be souls that will not be saved. So Jesus talks about, you want to know how to be a good sheep? What God looks at, what he wants with his people? Well, let me read this real quick. This is found in Matthew 7, verse 15 through 23. And we're going to go in real quick about pointing out a false sheep so we can be the opposite of false. We want to be God's sheep. So Matthew 7, 15. I found this very... Interesting in the way that God looks at mankind. It says, Beware of false prophets who come in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do not men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Um, therefore, by the fruits you will know them. In verse 21, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in the day, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons? So what is Jesus looking for in his sheep, in his people? How can we be an effective tool or effective people for Jesus Christ Turn with me to Mark chapter 12. Maybe we can get a little bit of a picture of what Jesus is looking for in his people and how we can be effective for Christ. In Mark chapter 12, verse 38 through 40. Chapter 12, 38 through 40 says... Beware of the scribes. Now, who were the scribes? Who were the scribes, and what, were their, what was their job in the times of Christ? They were, the of the they were the leaders of the church. I find this very interesting. I call the 12 disciples, I, I call them kind of, it was Jesus' dream team. This was his guys. This was his disciples. Were there any religious leaders, scribes or Sadducees, in God's disciples? Were they any? They were commoners, right? Lay people. Why them? Why lay people and not scribes and Pharisees? Did they have the truth? So, all right. So, what were they lacking? Love. Hmm. Okay. Well, let's go over that real quick, and then we're going to go back to what Jesus is looking for in his people. In 38 and 40, he says, Beware the scribes who desire to go around in long robes, love greeting in the marketplace, the best seats in the synagogue, and the best places at feasts, who devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers, These will receive greater condemnation. You know, one of the things I had the privilege when I was down in Texas to be a a head elder for a few years, and we used to do training every year. And one of the most important things they used to tell us in training was to protect the pulpit. What we talk about when we are preaching needs to be from the Bible and the Bible alone. Now, I have a beautiful Bible that my wife got me that actually has a spirit of prophecy also in the Bible. It makes it really easy because, well, one beautiful thing about spirit of prophecy is, oh, 
Ellen White had just these beautiful stories that God would give her and vision that she would write about. And I hope it has made your relationship with Jesus Christ more intimate and closer. I know it has me because do you guys want to be intimate with the Lord? Amen. Yeah, right? I mean, oh, to think, to think, to meditate on what Jesus Christ, our shepherd, has done for us. I want to be a good sheep. You guys want to be a good sheep? All right, let's go to Matthew 20, 25. I don't know about you, but I desire to be in a church. You know, we talk about a sanctuary. What is, why do we call our, where we meet a sanctuary? What is it supposed to represent? The temple. The temple, right? What was the temple's purpose? Why did God set up the temple? Sin, right? Because we are separated from God because of our sinful nature, right? We cannot be in the presence of God at this time. The temple is set up. How many here are dealing with sin? Struggling with sin? Do you know in this sanctuary is the place to bring our sins? Bring them in front of the cross of Christ. I sometimes think we forget the power that is in this place. Where two or, two or more gathered, who's here right now with us? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is with us. We should be able every week as we come to meet Christ in the Sabbath, walk out these doors knowing that we are right with our Heavenly Father each and every week. So what's the purpose of the church? Why do we meet? Why do we gather? Why are we like sheep who congregate together? What is the purpose? Hmm? Encourage each, other. Encourage each other. Has everybody here had a good week? Anybody here had a bad week? Anybody, if you're honest? I mean, has everybody just had a great week? Anybody have any challenges this week? A few years ago, my wife and I, we were going through a class to improve our marriage. I like intimacy. And I hope we needed to learn how to be more intimate, how to communicate, how to talk to one another, how to... You know Satan, he hates marriages, right? He'd like nothing more than to destroy our homes and break up our marriages. One of the most powerful things I have ever seen, I wish I could say... I've seen it in a sanctuary, but this was a group of like-minded people who wanted to improve their marriage. So we were all around the same age. We all had uh, children, you know, all around, been married around the same time. What we did, it was like five of us, is we went through a series of Bible studies to make our marriage stronger. And we prayed over one another every week for 16 weeks and after that, I tell you, they are some of the most spiritual people. The closest I've ever been to anybody in my life was because we went through a shared experience. I don't know what you deal with sin-wise. You know, Satan runs it by you. I don't know. For most men, they would say that most men struggle with pornography. Most women struggle with gossiping. There's different aspects if we are a church and we are to lift up one another, how do we lift up each other? Prayer. Through prayer. I went to that same church that was doing this series, and what they would do, instead of making church a gossip time, they built friendships with one another. When somebody was struggling with maybe family or sickness or pornography or whatever it was, they had church members that surrounded them and prayed for them and lifted each other up. It is the most powerful thing I've ever seen, and I rarely see that in the Seventh-day Adventist church. And I think we are missing an opportunity to lift up Christ, because folks, Sabbath ain't always happy. I know sometimes we are afraid to share with people what we've been going through because we are afraid we will be judged. And that is not of God, folks. That is, who's the accuser? Jerry? Satan is the accuser. 
So when we hear people behaving in this manner, we know that we are around false sheep or tares or whatever you want to say. Are we, what, what, is, what is the responsibility as us as sheep of service of Christ? Turn with me in Matthew chapter 20, verse 25. I'm going to wrap this up pretty quick, but we are getting ready to go into a series of evangelism, and Satan is not happy about that, folks. He will do absolutely everything in his power to break up what we are going to do. And why? Because through a Revelation seminar and a three angels message, we expose Satan for what he is. I didn't grow up in this message, and I could not believe what Satan was doing around the world. And we have the opportunity, the blessing to share this with our friends and family. But we have to be united. We have to be united as sheep in Matthew 20, 25 through 28. Let's see, 20, 25 through 28 says, But if Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are of great exercise authority over them, yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. There's a key. Be a servant. And it's also in leadership, folks. The higher up you serve in God's church, the more of a leader you need to become. Why? Well, let's find out. Why that is so important for us to be servants. In verse 27 said, Whosoever deserves to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for man. You want to be a good sheep? Serve. Serve one another. Let's start doing it here. If we can serve one another, build up one another, nurture one another, as we start having people come in, believe me, it ain't. If you've never been in a church setting, it is scary the first time you come in church. Am I wrong? Yeah, it can be scary because you know what the feedback I'm getting over and over is hypocrisy. Is there hypocrisy in God's church? Of course there is. We are fallen people. Does God want hypocrisy in our church? How then do we become what we claim to be? What's the key? Love relationship. What's our power source? Prayer. Most definitely. But what did, what did Jesus send in his place? The Holy Spirit, folks, if we would come together in prayer as we are preparing for this evangelistic series coming up, I've been through, we've been through a dozen evangelistic series over the years, and I'll tell you what happens when we don't do this, when we're not united and we don't invite the Holy Spirit in, they go out the door about as fast as they come in. Why? Because they do not see in action what they have been shared in God's word. Did God make human beings to be a social animal? Or are we solitary? All right. We, we love to be together. And I've said this many times, and I mean it. You guys are my family. When I became a Seventh-day Adventist, all my friends and acquaintances I had within about six months because of the difference in lifestyle were gone. And I struggled for so many years in this church because I didn't have friends. I didn't have people that I could trust, people that I could talk to, people that I could cry with. Because believe me, not every Sabbath you come through that door has been a happy Sabbath. I'll be honest, most of my weeks are a struggle. There's been highs and lows and a lot of times I think we walk through that door being beat up. We need to come into this sanctuary so we can be revived and refreshed and walk out those doors victorious and be able to share this with this dying world. If it's not safe in here, will you bring your friends? Would you ever bring a friend into a hostile environment? I wouldn't. So... I'm going to share with something real quick. What's the duty of, our, of we as sheep? What is God desiring us to do? Let's, 
Love one another. It all starts with love, right? It all starts with love. If we can love one another, if we can pray, are we going to have differences? Oh, of course. I mean, hey, not everybody likes the color blue. Happens to be my favorite color. I bet if I went around here, we would have all different kind of colors that we like or dislike. Are we gonna, is, that a, is that a salvation issue? Are we going to fight over this? I'm the closest to Jesus Christ when I'm in my kayak, but since I can't get you all out in a kayak on a river to show you what the relationship I have with Christ is, I try to paint a picture here, relationships. Jesus is all about relationships. When he come to this earth, he did not sit on the throne and isolate himself from people. Matter of fact, the church was so damaged at that time that he had to go out to reclaim the people. And... Folks, this work is not going to get done. Just because we build a church does not mean everybody will come, folks. It's it's the truth of the matter. People have been hurt. People are scared. We're going to have to get out to the people. Start smiling. Start meeting people. Start getting to know people. People, if they feel safe and feel that you like them and care about them, they will listen to what we have to say. So let's finish this up real quick. In 1 Thessalonians 5, let's, uh, let's start with 12. Let's go to 12 through 28. And I'm going to go through this real quick. We urge you, brethren, to recognize that those who labor among you are over in the Lord and admonish you. 13 says, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace with yourselves. It all starts with having peace with yourself. Now, 14, how we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourself and for all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks for his will of God and Jesus Christ for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise property, prophecy. Test all things. Hold fast that what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. And 23 says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved. Blame us at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all brethren with a holy kiss. Now, that may take a little time before we can start kissing one another, but hey, a nice hug or handshake, let's just start with that, okay? Now, I charge you, verse 27, by the Lord, that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Folks, as I finish this sermon up this morning, I want you to know that my wife and I, we pray for this church every day. We pray for our leadership. We pray for family. We pray for you all. You know, we're fixing to go through a hard time like we have never, ever, ever seen. We are, we're it. We're each other's support system, folks. We're going to go through hard times. We're going to have times in which we are going to need to pick one another up and hold one another and tell them that it is okay. As we finish up today, I just want you to know that we serve a shepherd who died for us. And Satan, what is what has he done for us? He accuses us. He wants to keep us in a state of conflict. We have God has graciously given us time. Yeah, the wheat and the tares are together right now, but I tell brothers and sisters, God wants each and every one of us in the kingdom. And he is doing his part with the wheat and the tares to accomplish that. Let's close this out with prayer real quick. Dear Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to be called one of your sheep, Lord. But we cannot keep this message 
to ourselves, Lord. We need to keep adding to the flock. Lord, we need to make the sanctuary a place of power. Lord, there is still power in your blood. And we need to bring it into your sanctuary. As we struggle with sin, this dying world needs to hear what we have to say. But we need to make this a safe place where people will recognize you, your shepherd, that dwells in this place. May you give us a heart transfer, Lord. Will you clean, our, clean up our lives and help us to overlook each other's fallacies. Lord, we all know we're sinners. We all know we struggle with sin. So what we need most of all, Lord, is to look at people the way you look at us. You were willing to die for us so that we may be with you. May we surrender our will to you so that we can not only lift one another up, but we can embrace those that come through the door and we can embrace those that you will lead us to this coming week. Thank you for everything you have done and thank you for the promise that you are coming back soon. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.